6 of 1 Timothy. So if you get a Bible, if you don't have a Bible, please raise your hand and we'll get you one. But it's really absolutely necessary that you are testing everything by the Word of God. You've got to have your Bibles open. And we encourage you to be reading at home and reading ahead of time. And um, also want to say a little bit about the baptism, too. This, you know, um, is something, an area that the Lord Jesus commands us to obey him. And he tells the church to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And so it's an important step of obedience. But it always comes after the fact that you've been born again and that you've been saved by the grace of Jesus Christ, faith in him, not by work so that no man can boast. Do you understand? It does not save you. But it is a, there's something about it, we might even call it mysterious, because the Lord, he, he honors it when you take that step of faith and identify yourself with Christ. And as you go under the water, of course, that's a symbol of Jesus dying on the cross for your sins and being buried on, uh, in Calvary, you know, at, in the tomb. And then as you come out of the water, in the washing of the water and everything is Jesus' resurrection, but it is also the washing uh, that the word does with us and also his blood that washes away the sins. And so it's very symbolic in that way, but there's something about it that is so important. I remember the day I was baptized, and it was something that really helped me take off in my spiritual life. It really did. From that point on, I could see. And we're going to be praying for you to be filled with the Holy Spirit, to be, um, you know, what we would call baptized with the Holy Spirit or filled with the Holy Spirit. And we're going to be praying over you and asking that the Lord would just really strengthen you. So if you have not yet been baptized, but you have believed upon Christ, you've been born again, you're a child of God, you're going to heaven, but you've not been obedient yet unto baptism, I challenge you, and I really, really um, uh, would just really advise you, please uh, identify yourself with Jesus through baptism. There's something special waiting for you. All right, we're in chapter 6 of 1 Timothy, and, um, you know, somebody once said in politics, it's about the money, stupid. And uh, in America, I, I think that's very, very true, that um, America has been, you know, rightfully or wrongfully very spoiled when it comes down to material things. Do you realize this? Here's a fact, that if your family income is only $10,000 a year, now I think probably most of us are over that, if not every last one of us, that's really a low poverty level thing. It, but listen, if your family income is only $10,000 a year, you know that you're wealthier than 84% of the rest of the world. 84%. Now, let's bring it up. If you... If your household makes $50,000 a year or more, you make more than 99% of the rest of the world. And so as we're going to be talking about this, uh, again, it's, it still comes into how do we be, how do, are we to be men or women of God in a very materialistic world and indeed, money is involved, and yet it's used in the church, it's used in the, in the furtherance of the gospel, it's used to feed our, our, ourselves, it's used to provide enjoyment. There's all kinds of things. How do we have a proper attitude towards it? We're kind of continuing from last week, uh, so to speak. But in America, we've got to realize, guys, this really, when, when we are going to be talking about people who are rich in this present world. And we would also, I guess, relatively speaking, we'd say, oh, that's somebody else. It's not me, right? But you, you've seen the statistics right there. 
that I just gave you. And I believe this applies to every one of us here. And so some of us, when we listen uh, to, when we study about finances or we study about uh, materialism or we study about being greed or greedy or having a love for money, we kind of turn off because we say, well, I'm poor. That doesn't apply to me. Or I, I don't have much. Or, or I'm always struggling for finances. Guys, listen, you're probably more wealthy than the vast majority of this planet. And, and I believe that this really is the same things. You know what? I, you can be someone of, of, uh, of not very much um, money or means or income and still have a love and a lust for money that leads to, as we're going to see, all kinds of evil, okay? A lot of people who don't have a lot of money go out and rob stores and commit thefts. Why is that? Well, most of the time, it's because, bottom line, it's a love of money. It's a lust for it. And, and um, so, Americans, you know, we have it pretty good here. We have access to health care even it, before the Health Care Act and all of that stuff. If you showed up at an emergency, they cannot turn you down and, and all of that stuff. Even our homeless, even the people that are on the streets oftentimes are, are extremely privileged. It's amazing how much money can be made by holding up a sign. And matter of fact, they're a little, little bit spoiled. Some of our, I had a, a, a panhandler ask me the other day, he said, uh, he asked me if I could spare 275 for a double cappuccino with fo no foam. And I just said, you know what, sure, no. But you know what I mean? <laughs> That's my joke for today. That I should have a snare drum up here. Somebody's got a psh. But nowadays, I think that uh, we can be divided into three classes. You know, people say, well, we're of the haves, the have-nots, and then also we could add on that the have-not paid for what we have. You know what I mean? And a lot of us in couples here, and married couples, need to... Uh, really undergo plastic surgery. We, we need to cut up a lot of plastic, don't we? A lot of plastic that we use. And so it seems to me that this passage teaches us to use our money in a way that will bring us really eternal riches and rewards. You know, we think about what hedonism today is. Hedonism is a lust for pleasure. It, it, it's a philosophy where everything, you're, you're constantly seeking out pleasure through money, finances, uh, lusts in your life, whatever it may be. It's hedonism, right? And, and you're always looking for that, that, that in experience of, of uh, having uh, uh, happiness and joy. But you know what? In a way, that's what God's, Jesus promised us eternally. If we will live not for the riches of this world, but live for the riches of the kingdom of God, produce fruit for his kingdom, treasures for his kingdom, that that is really what he says here. There's a, there is, is eternal reward, eternal happiness, and eternal things that will happen as we live for what is yet to come. Even though we don't see Jesus today, we live for him uh, anyway. And so there is a desire to be rich. And I wanted to uh, read that. Look at verse 9 with me. People who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. I was just talking with somebody, a friend of mine, and he said something to the effect, you know what, if I ever won one of them lotteries, you know those 400 million ones? I, and he told me all these grandiose things that he would do and giving a lot of it away and everything, and I was thinking, yeah, you know, that sounds good to me too. What, what a pipe dream that is, you know? And yet here, you know, is that, that whole thing here, is that 
The problem begins with people who want to get rich fall in to temptation and ruin and destruction and desires. Remember, Jesus said to them, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed because a man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Did you hear what he said? A man's life does not consist of the abundance of his possessions. Wait a second, some would say. Of course, money gives me everything I want. I get money, I get, I, I get to eat whatever I desire, I get to wear whatever I want. I, I look, at, look at the advantages of, of having money and people pay attention to me, give me respect. It buys me a home, it buys food for my family. We would put probably most of us a lot more emphasis on those things. But Jesus says that's not what life really consists of. That, that there's so much more to life that perhaps a love of riches and a, and a desire to be rich, a passion for it, a lust for it, will mask over the really essential, important things of life. Guys, some of us have been divorced. Some of us have been maybe down that road of, wow, when we were first married, you know, we, we really, when we look back at it, it was so much about making money and having this and having that that we really kind of didn't take the time with each other in our marriage to really, you know, come together and really, and really, really love one another and pay attention to the needs of one another. We were so busy. Some of us might even look, if you look really harshly, it's almost like we we kind of sold our children off to what we wanted, the new cars and the new TVs and the new things, the cable and all that kind of stuff. And we can look back and see how those decisions affected what was really important in life. Some of us could look back that way and we would say, man, I was that way. I don't want to be that way anymore. But notice there's a progression, would you? In this verse... This progression is, first of all, people who, and I want you to circle in your Bible, want. Want. Circle that. That's the first part of the progression. People who want to get rich. That's your desire. That's your passion. And so God says the first thing, it starts with a desire that is not good, a passion that is not good. Later on in this, we're going to see that the man of God or the woman of God um, seeks after certain things. And so that's kind of like, as we're going to be talking more on the negative side of things at first, these are the things that we're going to go through. What are those things that we should desire in our life? What are those things we should pursue? Do you understand? The good things. Because God never, listen guys, very important. God will never take something away from you without replacing it with something better. God will never take something away from you without replacing it or offering to replace it. It's whether we accept it or not. You know, we think about sexual sin and stuff and we, we say, you know what? Wait for marriage. Don't, don't uh, uh, live pure, you know? Try to live in purity. Uh, don't be drunk on wine, but, but look at, what does it say? Be filled with the Holy Spirit. See, the, the alternative is there, and God will always give you something to replace what he has commanded you to leave behind. Do you understand? And so here he says, you know, uh, this want or this desire in our hearts and in our lives. You know what? Is it wrong to be rich in this world? No, it's not necessarily wrong at all. And so we shouldn't go to the opposite thing. Well, to be really, really, you know, mature and spiritual, you've got to give up everything, you know. That's not what the Bible teaches. But, but you know what? What we do with it is always putting God first. You know, there's a guy named Henry Crow, uh, Crowell. He contracted tuberculosis when a boy couldn't go to school. And after hearing a sermon by Dwight L. Moody, young Crowell 
prayed, I can't be a preacher, but I can be a good businessman. God, if you will let me make money, I will use it in your service. And so under the doctor's advice, Crawwell worked outdoors for seven years and regained his health. And then he bought the little rundown Quaker Mill at Ravana, Ohio. And within 10 years, Quaker Oats was a household world, a word to millions. For over 40 years, Henry P. Crawwell faithfully gave 60 to 70% of his income to God's purposes and causes, having advanced from an initial 10%. That's where Quaker Oats came from. Notice this progression, a want or a desire, but then later on, listen, there comes a fall. Then he said, notice it says in verse 9, people who want to get rich fall into temptation. Circle the word fall. Because after a lust or a desire to, that want to get rich comes the fall. Now remember, it's not wrong to want to succeed. It's not wrong to want to have a raise. We're not saying that, okay? But what it's speaking about is a, is a lust, a desire for something that you don't have. It's a passion in your life that overtakes uh, that desire. And what it ends up doing is making you fall. The first thing is you fall. I don't know how many people I've seen that fall into sin over this area. I know lots of people, and I used to do it myself when, before I was a believer. I, I, even when I was a kid, you know, I'd go into the grocery store, I'd have this big heavy coat on uh, over from Bret Hart Elementary School, and I'd walk down to the Safeway store, and I'd go in there as a, you know, probably an eight or nine-year-old, and I'd stuff my sleeves with Hershey bars. I'm rich in Hershey's. And I go in there, and man, it worked a few times, and then I got busted. By, I got busted, man. This guy, one of the checkers at the store sees me. Hey, you, let me see what's inside your coat, you know, and all these things drop out, you know. I don't have anything, and they drop out. And then that very evening, as I got caught, he says, I may never see you again. I had to go in there with my mother, to go shopping and I was so petrified because we actually went to the same guy and it was just like the most anxious feeling I had in my life. I was going to get really busted, but I didn't. We got away with it. Oh, we know what that's like. You fall into sin over that area. You fall into sin. So many people are, are, are doing that that way. We think about robberies and, and all of that kind of stuff. Matter of fact, this last month in May, in Mexico, there was over 2,400 murders in Mexico just last month. It is because of that amount, it is more dang, it's the only uh, more dangerous place in all of the world than Mexico is being in Syria where the war is. It's amazing. But what, what is that all over? What are all these murders about? What? No. It's about trying to be rich. Wanting to be rich. Drugs are the vehicle of it, right? That's just the vehicle. That's the, that's the means. But it's all over a lust for wanting to be rich. And so, he says that, first of all, there's that trend, I want the want, people want to get rich, circle that word, and they fall into temptation, and then lastly, look at the, or the next one is the trap that is there. People who want to get rich fall into temptation, and circle the word trap. You can get into a place where you, you, you can't get past it. It traps you because whatever possessions you have, whatever it is that you, that you accumulate in your life, guess what? You have to now maintain it, right? You've got to maintain that. You've got to take care of that big boat, right? 
you get that nice shiny new car and you're all worried about dings and all this stuff. And so you park a mile away in the parking lot where there's nobody else because you're afraid, right? You have to maintain that lifestyle that now you've gotten used to it. And so there is also a trap. And then lastly, look at the next part. It says, and into many foolish, harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. It can leave you, leave you so low that the next thing that happens is financial ruin, personal, emotional ruin, all of these things, and absolute destruction. And so we need to really, really watch out, guys, for that love of money. People who want to get rich, verse 9, fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. Why? For the love of money. Interesting. The word love here is agape. Isn't that interesting? It's used in a negative context here. It's, it's the word for unconditional love. Well, unconditional love towards God is the goal, right? It's the, it's the most perfect manifestation of our faith in Christ is to have agape for not only God, but for one another. But when it comes down to that is your love for money, woo, you're in trouble. You're in trouble, man. Because the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And some people look at eager for money, have wandered from the faith and have pierced themselves with many griefs. Many griefs. And so, listen, guys, it's a root that leads to all kinds of evil. And it has pierced people, have been pierced themselves with many griefs over money. How many times has that been true in your marriage? The most common thing that newlyweds and, and people in their first year or so of, of their big arguments, and I think it, it ends up most of marriage, is over money, right? Worries about money. And, and sometimes you have the spend thrift and you have the guy, the person in the marriage that just, man, they just can't see anything they shouldn't have, you know? And they buy all the toys and the trinkets, and the other one is real, you know, come on, we got to save, we got to watch out for this. And there's that, that balance that comes really when we come together in Christ. There is a wonderful balance in that. Either side is not right by itself. But he says it leads to many evils it pierces they pierce themselves with many griefs and a desire you see for money it, it never can be satiated that's the problem have you ever heard or known of people that are compulsive gamblers they can be sometimes very lucky man like uh, walking in wealth from one of their good bets or the horses came in the right way or the roulette table went the right way or the poker went uh, really well for them and yet they never have enough and they got to keep going back until they lose it all it's a compulsive thing it can never be satisfied uh, there's an old Roman saying, it says, wealth can be like seawater. Rather than quenching a man's thirst, it intensifies it. The more he gets, the more he wants. There was a husband and a wife that were at a county uh, fair, and for five bucks a person, it was a great deal, a man was giving rides on an old biplane, you know, the double wings and all that. And, and so the couple wanted to go up, but they thought the price was too steep. And so consequently, they tried to negotiate a lower price. And she, they said, hey, look, we'll pay you five bucks, but we both want to go. It would be five bucks for the two of us. And the pilot said, well, uh, you know, he's, they said, after all, we both have to squeeze into that tiny cockpit that was built for only one person. And so the pilot refused to lower his price, but he made a counteroffer. And he said to the couple, Pay me the full price of 10 bucks and I'll take you up. But if you don't, and if you don't say one word or scream or anything like that, uh, during the flight, I'll give you all your money back. 
okay, if I don't hear anything from you, I'll give you all your money back. And so the couple agreed. They got into the plane. They went up, and the pilot proceeded to perform every trick he knew, looping, you know, whirling, flying upside down, just, you know, all these things, loop the loop. And finally, when the plane had landed, the pilot said to the husband, he says, congratulations, here's your 10 bucks back. You didn't say a single word. To which the man uh, replied, he says, no, but I almost did when my wife fell out back there. I, oh, I'll tell you, almost got me there. The things we'll do for money. Some of us, you know, we thought about when we learned about putting the Lord first in our finances, we, we said, well, I don't have any money. I only make this little amount. And, and so we kind of bowed out of, oh, that's not for me. And then now you got 10 years, 20 years in the Lord now, and you're making five times as much, and you got all this stuff, and you're still not putting the Lord first. You got a problem. And that problem is piercing you. It pierces you with many griefs. And it leads to all kinds of evil. And so let's look. Let's do a little test. Am I guilty of the love of wanting to be rich or a love of money, a lust of it, an agape love, an unconditional love towards it? Um, How do you know? Well, let me ask you a couple questions. Do you spend more time thinking about how to get money than how to do a good job. How to do a good job. Do you spend more time thinking about the dough and making more money? Or do you think more about doing a good job? Um, Well, what about you? you? Are you satisfied with how much you have or are you dissatisfied? Do you live in kind of just this kind of itch, this scratch of that I gotta have more, I gotta have more. This is not enough. Let me ask you another question. When, when um, you know, when you get stuff and you buy stuff and all that stuff, do you flaunt it in front of people? Do you, uh, you know, wear, you like wearing it so people can see it? You like driving it to show it off? You like living in it and, and asking people over just so that you can show off what it is that you've got? Let me ask you another question. Uh, uh, Do you resent giving it away? Do you resent giving your money? Whatever it may may be, resent it. It kills you to give it away. You use all your money to get something for yourself, but you never seem to have enough to just minimally give to the Lord and put him first in your life. Let me ask you another question. Um, What will you do to obtain it? Will you cheat? Will you connive? Will you lie? Will you take shortcuts? In other words, will you sin to obtain money? Will you sin to obtain it? Lie on your income tax. Cheat on your expense report. Destroy friendships or let them erode for the sake of promotions or whatever. Compromise your convictions to get it. All of those things are signs that you have an improper love and attitude towards money and getting rich. Let me ask you something. I'm going to give you, now I want you to think. Suppose somebody passes empty-handed through the turnstiles at a big city art museum and begins to take the pictures off of the wall, these millions of dollars, you know, pictures, and he starts taking them off the wall, wall and he starts to carry them with a very important look on his face under his arm. He's got a Michelangelo under his armpit, you know, he's like walking around like he's a big shot, right? And you come up to him and you say, what are you doing? And this guy answers, he says, I'm becoming an art collector. (laughs) Well, that's not really your painting, you say. And besides, they're not going to let you out with those paintings out of the museum. You have to go out just like you came in to the museum. But he answers again, and he says, sure, they're mine. I've got 
them under my arm and people look at me as I, like I'm import, an important dealer in the halls and I don't bother myself with thoughts about leaving. So just quit being a killjoy, man. Now, we would call this man a fool. We would call him out of touch with reality, right? But so is the person who spends himself to get rich in this life because we're going to go out the same way we came in. Do you understand? Another way, pic picture 269 people entering into eternity through a plane crash. And before the crash, there's a noted politician on the plane. There's a millionaire corporate executive. There's a playboy and his playmate and a missionary kid on the way back from visiting grandparents. And they all die in this crash. And then after the crash, they stand before God, utterly stripped of every MasterCard, American Express card, checkbook, credit line. They're stripped of their expensive clothes, success books, and Hilton reservations. The politician, the executive, and the playboy, and the missionary kid are now on a level ground with nothing, absolutely nothing, in their hands, only what they brought in their hearts. How absurd. And how tragic the lover of money will see up, seem on that day before Almighty God. Like a man who spends his whole life collecting train tickets, and at the end he's so weighed down by that collection of tickets that he misses the last train. Don't Try to get rich, the Bible says. For we brought nothing into this world and we can take nothing out of it. Now, how can we be saved from this? Look at verse 17 with me. Command those who are rich in this present world, first of all, not to be arrogant. Not to be arrogant. Not to be proud. And I believe when you are proud about your richness or whatever material wealth you have, you're proud about it, it's because basic problem in your life is that God is not Lord. He is not Lord of that area of your life, of your heart. Do not be arrogant. Because the first thing that starts to happen is you go to the nice places and you start hanging out with these people that are on a different economics, you know, level, right? Then you start going down that path of arrogance and pretty soon, oh, I'm not really accessible to the other people, the plain people, the, the poor people. You see what I mean? God can't use us in the lives of people who might be struggling, who might be on a, 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 a very uneven path in their life. But we have this uh, uh, idea in our head of what we are. Stop being arrogant. Number two, look at it, it says, nor put your hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but put your hope in God. Oh, man, don't stop putting your hope in wealth. Oh, you know what, man, I'll be, you know, I've got it stacked away. I've got all of my stocks. I've got all of these things. Uh, you know what, I'm just trusting that I'm going to be living the rest of my days in Hawaii or on the beach or whatever. I got this big, uh, you know, thing. It's not wrong to plan for retirement. But listen, the, the, the real reality is, guys, for a Christian, you're never retired. <laughs> there is no, ret your retirement's when, you, <laughs> you know, even that's not retirement in heaven. You, you, you start a new job, but you're never going to retire from God. Do you understand? And, and don't put your hope in wealth, which is, notice, so uncertain. Where were we uh, uh, 10 years ago in the economy? Where were we? A lot of us lost our homes, didn't we? A lot of us lost our jobs, couldn't find a job for a long time. Right before it, man, everything was booming, Right? Out of the Clinton era there, you know, when we, the economy was way up high and, and all of that stuff. Man, it was like, it seemed like, man, there, it, it, we have a ticket to just riches and, and prosperity and everything ahead. Man, our houses were way up high, right? 
And then what happened? It was all phony. It was all a facade. And all of a sudden, it just went like one of those balloons. Or like me being popped. Amen. And then what happened, guys? We lost everything, right? Some of, some of us lost at least half of the value of our homes. Some of us we were, were called what? Underwater, right? Underwater, man. Our, we owed way more on our house than, than it was even worth. We couldn't even get out of it. And so, so many of us struggle. It's uncertain. Do you understand? What is certain is Jesus. What is certain is God's provision, and that's what it says. Look at this. It says, but to put your hope in God who richly provides us with everything. And look what he says. He even throws us in for our enjoyment. God is not, he's not like against enjoyment. That's the purpose. He gives us everything in this life for our enjoyment. And you see that that's what goes on in our heads. We say, well, geez, if I put God first in, my, in this area of my life, there goes all my enjoyment, right? There goes all my enjoyment. No, God gives you everything for your enjoyment. Trust God. He'll provide for you more richly than you ever imagined. And then notice he says, verse 11 Oh, let, let's continue. I, I didn't get this. Look at verse 18. Command them to do good. To do good. Let that be the pursuit of what you're doing. Let that be the end goal in your job, in what you're doing. Not making more money at any cost, but let it be that you're doing a good job, that, you're, that, that there is in your work, that you're doing, basically doing something good in your life, that you're pursuing after a good goal. That everybody in their lives is, is after that goal of doing good. Don't ever get tired of that. And then notice what it says, command them to do good and to be rich in good deeds. Rich in good deeds. Are you rich in good deeds? I, I know that a lot of the good deeds that I thought I had are going to probably find out on the judgment seat of Christ that they weren't so good, actually. Maybe some of them had a bad motive or whatever it is. They weren't to glorify God. But, but I trust that every little thing that God sees that as I try to do good, he says, I'm going to reward you richly for that one day. When you go, uh, when, when, as a Christian, when we die or when Jesus takes us back, we will go before a judgment, but not a judgment of our sin. It's already been judged on Calvary. But we will go for a judgment of reward. Remember when we used to go trick-or-treating and stuff? I mean, it's a bad analogy, I guess. But we'd, we'd be like, you know, we're all dressed up and all this stuff. We knock on this door, ding! dong or ring the bell and we're thinking oh what has she got and if we're really really lucky we don't get one of those cheapos with the little half a cent candies that they put one in your thing what a cheapo we used to go to the rich neighborhoods we go over to curtis park or land park and they give whole candy bars over there man and we're looking we got our bags open and we're waiting for the the little lady to come to the door and say ooh and we're looking to see what she's going to give us. Right? You remember that? Guys, when we go before the Lord, it's going to be, what am I going to receive from the Lord? What riches is he going to give me? Eternal riches. And that's where God wants us to be. And so look at what he says Command them to do good and be rich in good deeds and to be generous, generous, and notice, willing to share. Some of us live, you know, bottom line is, you know, we figure, well, you know, I'm going to talk about people that tithe. We tithe and we say, well, I, you know, I give my 10%. There's nothing else that I need to do. Is that really? 
What, where is the Lord, where is that generosity in your life, that, that being willing to share what God has given you materially with other people? And that's where God has called us to be. And it says, this is the way, in this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a, notice, firm foundation in the coming age. Guys, do you know, I've told you before, you know, all, when we get to heaven, whenever that is, a million years from then, you're all coming over to my pad, right? We're going to have a barbecue. We're going to, you know, re, you know, slap fives and heaven, whatever it is. We, you know, do you understand what the reason I say that is because we're going to be together as brothers and sisters in the Lord, man. We're going to be in eternity together. And so he's saying the foundation, lay up a treasure uh, for yourselves as a firm foundation that will affect all of the age ahead, all of the billions and trillions of years. Guys, that's pretty important, isn't it? You ever seen a house in Mexico? We used, when we went to Mexico on our years ago, on one of our trips, we went to this poor lady's house and it was just a shack. And there was no foundation, it was dirt. And, and so we rebuilt the house, but the first thing we did is we poured a little foundation. We poured a foundation that was solid and strong out of cement. So it would last, it would go on for years and years. Inside of her shack with the tin and all that stuff and the dirt and muddy floor and all that stuff when it would rain It would be all muddy in there. There was those what are those scorpions in there and all that stuff And man, we got uh, that firm foundation We put the walls up on it and the roof on it and then the windows and all that stuff It was such a wonderful thing to have that fun. Do you see what God is saying? Be rich in good deeds be willing to share Look at your finances in a, in a way that you put God first and you, and you do that because what you're doing, guys, is you're laying up treasure for yourselves as a firm foundation for the coming age. And notice what he says, so that they may take hold of the life, which is truly life. This is a very important area, isn't it? It's not about wanting you guys to give the church more money. It's not about any of that. I, I, I'm not even talking about that. It's about the way we deal with materialism in our lives. And so we're to flee. Look at verse 11. But you, man of God, flee from all of this. Flee from it. And pursue righteousness and godlessness, godliness and faith and love and endurance and gentleness. And so what he said to Timothy is this, he's reminding him who he is. You're a man of God. Flee from this kind of stuff. And that's who you are. You're a man or a woman of God. Flee from all of this worldly viewpoint towards materialism in your life. And then secondly, we should follow what the man of God should, follows after. Look at verse 11. But you, O man of God, flee from all this and pursue righteousness, which means right doing, godliness, faith, building your, where does faith come? It comes by hearing the word of God, just what's going on right now, and applying it to your life. That's how you build your faith. Pursue that, man. Pursue love in your life, to have more of that coming through you, flowing through you in your life. And endurance, man, pursue endurance when things get tough and get hard in your life. It's like training. If you're going to go train to be a runner, an Olympic runner, we have the trials going on right now and the championships uh, being established over at Sac State right now. These guys have been working for years and years and years to develop the endurance. Why? Because they want to finish at the goal ahead. They want to win the race or complete the race. Guys, we need to start looking at hardship that we're going through in that way. Instead of trying to, you know, well, I'm just going to leave church because it doesn't work. 
or I'm just going to give in to my flesh and be a drunk because of what's going on in my life. We need to seek out, pursue endurance in our life because God is building character and all of these things in us. And lastly, he says, you know what? Flee from all this and pursue gentleness, grace in your life with people. And then look what he follows after. Look, uh, those things, righteousness and godliness and faith and love and endurance and gentleness. And he says also in verse 12, fight for what the man of God or the woman of God should fight for. Verse 12, fight the good fight of the faith. Fight that good fight, guys. We're called to be holy. We're called to reject all forms of evil. We're called to fight against, uh, you know, to fight uh, in our lives, to fight against the demons of hell and all of these things, to take on that battle of thought life. So important that we take things captive unto Jesus Christ. Fight the good fight and then look what he takes hold of. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Guys, take hold. Take hold. I wonder today, a lot of us came in here with a lot, we're all different. Some of us, but I think one thing that's all common to us is we all have hurts. We all have wounds in our life. Spiritual wounds, things that are deep in our heart. Things that we need and we desire for healing in our lives. And Jesus wants to do that in our lives. It's not that he's just going to take away every trouble. Receive Christ, raise your hand in church, and then everything's going to be perfect in your life. No, no, no. It may be much harder. But I'm going to tell you, his victory will always be there, and you will never be in it alone. And there will always be a good purpose in whatever happens in your life. Oh, it's such a wonderful thing to trust Jesus Christ. Because it's not just about going to heaven, but it's also, I mean, that is the ultimate, but it's about this life too, that he wants to help us, that he wants to guide us and direct us and bless our life. And that he wants to provide for us in our enjoyment uh, of this, what is true abundant life. So let's bow our heads, would you please? Father God, we look at what your word says and we're convicted, Lord, about the things, Lord, that we take for granted, the riches you've given us. And Father, I know we all fall guilty, Lord, of not being open to share as much as we should, being open to give away what we should. We've certainly all been bad stewards at times over our finances. Lord, some of us need truly need plastic surgery and cut up all those credit cards, pay off our debts, to be good stewards. But Lord, let that not be the, the excuse to not put you first. Help us, Lord, to be people who pursue righteousness who pursue, Lord, riches in heaven. Lord, help us. And Lord, here there are some here, Lord, that, man, you know what? It's not even about that kind of stuff. It's about, man, I need help in my life. I'm here. I'm broken. I'm depressed. I'm anxious. I don't know what to do next. All I know is I, I'm here and I need God. And, and you know what? God understands all of that. God understands even the groans of your heart where you can't even put it into words. It, things are so confusing and so heavy. And today is the day where he was, wants to meet you in your heart. He wants to come into your heart. He says, behold, I knock on the door. If anybody opens the door, hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and we will fellowship together. Jesus said that. It, it corresponds to our human heart that we could receive him as our Lord and our Savior. It's not about religion. It's about a relationship with him. 
And he will wipe away our tears and he will wash our sins away. Is there any here that while heads are bowed, eyes are closed? To you that, uh, that appeals to you, you're, you're just at that place. I need God in my life. I just ask you to raise your hands up and just, Father, we thank you. Thank you over there. Anybody else? That's... Well, Father God, there's people here that are broken. There's people here that are really, you know, intoxicated, drunk, or drugs, things, Lord, that are going on in their lives that are just uh, crazy, Lord. And we just pray, God, for you to meet them, for you to come into their hearts, because none of that matters in, in the sense of, Lord, that you can uh, do all things even in the condition that we come to you in. And I pray, God, that you'd open their hearts. And I pray, God, that you would just meet them, Jesus, and heal them in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. Hey, stand up for the last song.